Hello, I'm Donald Leggett and welcome to this edition of Share Views, brought to you by London South East. I'm joined in the studio by Hayden Locke, CEO of Emerson, who are busy developing the world-class Chemisette Potash project in northern Morocco. Welcome, Hayden. Thanks, Donald. Greetings. So, uh, busy times again? Yeah, we've got a lot of work going on. As we said last time we were here, uh, we continue to make good progress on the project and uh, we're excited by the news flow that's coming out. Okay, Emerson. Who are Emerson for the uninitiated? If we're not familiar with the, in, the investment case, um, why should we be investing in a potash mine in northern Morocco? Yeah, we're developing what is a world-class potash project in northern Morocco. It's uh, industry-leading low capital cost production. Um, based on our scoping study of November last year, less than 10% of the total capital cost of the last potash project built. So very, very low capital cost, but also because of its location, um, the potential to create ap absolutely outstanding margins. Um, bottom quartile, all in, all in delivered cost to customer, meaning that the NPV and economics on this project are absolutely outstanding. Uh, this time around, you've just announced a resource upgrade. Um, uh, what difference does that make to the project? Well, it's significantly increased the scale. So the, the resource upgrade that we put out uh, increases the total resource tonnes by that's a bit over 70%, which is a pretty pretty large uplift in uh, number of resource tonnes for the project. Is that what you were hoping for? Actually, it's better than we expected. So we're very, very happy with the outcome of this result. It's, uh, it's incorporating all of the additional drilling that we've done um, at the project, so it's actually a better result than we had uh, originally anticipated. And I, to what extent does it add to the business case? Well, it's mostly about mine life extension and really the potential to uh, potentially upscale this project into a larger project. As we know, uh, as you grow the size of a project, you get economies of scale benefits, which can significantly improve your economics. And so we see the potential to actually upscale the size of this project uh, at some point in the future. So what has it done to the, 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 the timeline for the, for, the, for the mine life then? How much longer is it, is it extended by? Well, we don't know at this stage, so that'll probably come out of, as part of the feasibility study. But what we know now is given the amount of resource that's in the indicator category, we'll certainly have a reserve life of somewhere between 15 and 20 years, which is outstanding. And then there'll be a long non-reserve tail to the mine life as a result of these increased tonnes. Um, but I would be expecting it to be relatively significant increase over the 20 years that we had in the scoping study. So if you could define uh, indicated for us, what exactly does that mean in, in geology terms? Mm -hmm. So there are three categories of resource uh, under the Jork uh, code, which was outlined in Australia to really bring some, um, I, I guess, uh, uniformity into how these resources are uh, reported. Um, the lowest confidence category is the inferred confidence category. As you do more drilling and you obtain more geological data, you move to the higher confidence categories. And um, you can only report a reserve from the two highest confidence categories, which are measured and indicated. So it's really just a higher class of confidence in the mineral resource estimate that you have at the project. To what extent are your indicated reserves, you know, can you give me some sense of, of the scale of those? So of the a bit over half a billion tonnes of resource that we have now, about 70% are in the indicator category, so a significant proportion, about 375 million tonnes out of those sort of 530 million tonnes are now in the indicator category. And can you borrow against those? Once you deliver the feasibility study and then you uh, use all of the modifying factors from the feasibility study to give a reserve, and we would have a probable reserve based on those indicated resources, uh, then you would have the resource required to go to a bank um, and, and borrow against that. So yes, it is a fundamental step in the financing for a project like this. And in terms of time frame, where are we in terms of the feasibility study? Are we almost getting there? So we guided that it would be out sometime in the first half of next year, uh, and it's progressing really well. We are very close to the first lot of news flow starting to run out of that. Um, as we said, we break it down into the discrete portions of the study, and we're very close to that first lot of news flow coming out, and we're well on track to deliver the feasibility study uh, at least by the timelines that we guided the market, and I'm hopeful a little bit ahead of those those timelines. Okay, and you're not going to tell me when the first of those news flows is going to come because you can't, I presume? Well, I don't know yet, So, but it feels like it's getting closer given the work that's going on and the, and the reports that I'm getting from our engineers. Okay, within this RNS you included a, an economic cut-off grade calculation. 
So what is that? Uh, for, for, the, for me and the un uninitiated, what is that? Yeah, well, what it really does is shows the grade at which a mine will uh, m break even on an economic, in an economic sense. So where does it stop losing money and start making money in terms of grade of the ore in the ground that then gets turned into your final product? And what it really showed us is the economic credit cutoff grade is significantly below the one that we've used to limit the resource. And what that means is there's a lot of dirt still in the ground uh, or still in that uh, ground but not included in the resource that could potentially at some point uh, be economic for us to mine, especially when you consider we've paid, once we've paid back the capital. So really what it's saying and what it says to me is, yes, we've got a half a billion tonnes of resource, but the reality is there's probably significantly more than that and therefore there's probably significantly more mine life that we haven't even looked at yet and it's something that we can do at a later date. And a greater degree of profitability. Yeah, well, certainly the lower the grade, the, the lower the profitability becomes. But, uh, you know, once you've paid back your capital, as long as it's making money, then it still makes sense to, to mine that, sure. that there's resource. There's more of it, yes. Uh, you mentioned phase two extension. Um, what, what, tell me your plans for phase two. Well, given the size of the resource, uh, you know, one of the things we wanted was a multi-decade mine life uh, because that is what will potentially attract strategic financing interest. Uh, it, it, you know, having that much longer mine life uh, creates it a much more strategically valuable asset. Uh, but now that the resources increase significantly, we think that there is the potential that we can upscale the size of that uh, production profile. Um, you know, using the cash flow that the project will generate once we're up and running to really expand it and, and further improve those economics. And to give you an idea, um, using the scoping study metrics, if we were to increase the project by 50%, we would be producing over $300 million a year of EBITDA Good on average. It. So it is a very, very large project when you start to consider those sorts of numbers. Um, and let me chuck in a question about the, uh, turning the muriate of potash into the higher value sulphate of potash. Um, talk me through that. It's something that we've been considering. The, so the sulphate of potash is a niche uh, portion of the potash market, but very, very high value, and uh, especially in the US market. Um, it's currently serviced by Compass Minerals, who are an SOP producer. Uh, but we see a very real opportunity for us to take a portion of our MOP, convert it to SOP using what's called the Mannheim process, and, uh, and then delivering it into that US market where the, the significant premium uh, exists currently. And we think, based on our early indications, that that could be a very profitable business plan for us. So we're in the process of doing some detailed work on that. And um, once we've formulated a, a detailed business plan and done the preliminary economic assessment, we'll release that to the market Would that well. come at launch, or would that be a year or two into the, the, the life of the mine? I think it has to come post you starting the production uh, at the Chemiset Potash project, but it's certainly upside that we would then add uh, further down the track. Okay. So, um, final question, I, Outlook, what comes next? What so happens next? News flow? Yeah, this, so there, there, there are four items of news flow that we want to put out uh, as part of the feasibility study prior to actually releasing the feasibility study. Um, so I won't go into detail as to what those are, but they're going to be put out um, as the work is done and completed by our uh, engineering uh, team. Um, so there are significant news flow on that front. And then there are the usual um, memorandums of understanding that we will have with various in-country groups um, that really start to position us to actually take this mine from a concept into the construction phase and, and hopefully into production. Okay. Hayden Locke, CEO of Emerson PLC, developing a potash mine in northern Morocco. Thank you very much indeed for uh, uh, meeting us once again. If you enjoyed that interview and you'd like to uh, see other ones like it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much indeed.